Good morning, everyone. I'm Maria Kinchan, Dean of the Georgetown University McCourt School of Public Policy, and I am delighted to welcome you to today's event, Early Learning, Long-Term Benefits, Lessons from 20 Years of Research on Tulsa's Pre-K Program. McCourt Center for Research on Children in the United States, or CROCUS as we call it, has in convened an impressive group of expert panels that will consider the impact of high quality early childhood education on early and adult life from nearly every angle, including the effects of pre-K that persists through adulthood and how the long-term benefits of universal pre-K compare with the short-term costs how and why Oklahoma became a leader in early childhood education, and the public policy implications that could determine whether similar programs could be successfully implemented across America. And exclusively for today's audience, our CROCUS co-directors will reveal new findings from their path-breaking research study on government-funded pre-K in Tulsa, the largest school district in Oklahoma. We also look forward to today's keynote conversation with Colorado Governor Jared Paulus, a longtime advocate of early childhood care and education, moderated by McCourt School professor and Washington Post columnist E.J. Dion. So much of what we consider today is connected to or the result of the extraordinary scholarship and dedication of McCourt School professor Bill Gormley who along with his CROCUS co-director, Deborah Phillips, has been studying the same cohort of students in Tulsa for the last 16 years, from when they entered kindergarten in 2006 to now as they reach adulthood. It's hard to overstate the importance of evidence-based scholarship like this to the practitioners who work tirelessly to drive change in their communities, to the policymakers we partner with to evaluate government-funded programs, to the children and families who are ultimately served by them. This work goes right to the heart of our mission here at the McCourt School, tackling the complex issues of today and inspiring and empowering the policy leaders of tomorrow. I am deeply grateful to Bill, both for his service to Georgetown and to the McCourt School, and for his groundbreaking work in support of high quality early childhood education. Thank you, Bill. It is my pleasure to welcome Bill Gormley. Thank you, Maria, for your kind introduction, and thank you for your inspired leadership at the McCourt School. And good morning to all of you uh, here physically and those of you who are joining us virtually. When you think of Oklahoma, you may think of uh, Sooner football or perhaps a Rodgers and Hammerstein musical, uh, or perhaps uh, the Trail of Tears or the Oklahoma Land Rush. When you think of Tulsa, you may think of Garth Brooks, or Oil, or the TV show The Watchmen, or perhaps uh, the Tulsa Race Massacre of 1921. Some of these images are quite positive, others are quite negative. Whatever else comes to mind, if you care about children, then when you think of Tulsa, you should also think about universal pre-K, because Tulsa has been an undisputed leader in this area. Universal pre-K is a hot topic, and deservedly so. It focuses on young children, many of whom desperately need a helping hand, and most of whom can benefit from a strong preschool education. At its best, a universal pre-K is a gift that keeps on giving. The purpose of this conference is to learn more about universal pre-K by summarizing, analyzing, and interpreting evidence that we've been privileged to gather about Tulsa's universal pre-K program over the past 20 years. The Tulsa pre-K program is noteworthy in several respects. First, it's a relatively old program, having been established by the General Assembly in 1998. Second, it's a relatively high quality program, and you'll hear more about that in just a moment. Third, it's a program that serves a diverse cross-section of students. 
Fourth, it relies on two key service delivery mechanisms, school-based pre-K and Head Start. All of these features together have made Tulsa a very attractive site for us as researchers. It's been our great privilege to study this program and its effects over the past two decades. Beginning in 2001, we established a partnership with Tulsa Public Schools, or TPS, that continues to this day. Along the way, we've also received data from CAP of Tulsa County, which runs the Head Start program, from the Oklahoma Department of Education, from Union Public Schools, from Jenks Public Schools, from Broken Arrow Public Schools, from Epic Charter Schools, from Tulsa Community College, from Tulsa Tech, and from the National Student Clearinghouse. We're grateful to all of these folks for the trust and the confidence that they have shown in us. It hasn't been easy. We've encountered one tornado and one blizzard. On two occasions, we encountered impenetrable fog while trying to drive from Tulsa to Oklahoma City. We've experienced personnel changes at our end and in Tulsa and in Oklahoma City that required us to establish new relationships and new ground rules. But uh, throughout all of this, we've soldiered on and we've remained highly motivated. As social scientists, we've seen this as a rare opportunity to learn in depth how an early childhood education program works over time, including both triumphs and setbacks. Let me give you a sneak preview of what we're going to be doing at this special event. You will be hearing from approximately two dozen experts, including crocus researchers, former crocus researchers, seed researchers from a parallel project led by Professor Anna Johnson, and a wonderful assortment of people who've joined us from Oklahoma and from Tulsa in particular. If you follow me on Twitter, at BillGormley25, I will tweet comments during the day, to the best of my ability. <laughs> also, you will find an abundance of material on our website, www.crocus.georgetown.edu, including a number of new research papers that will be re released at approximately noon today, Eastern Standard Time. In the morning, we will focus on empirical evidence, including brief reviews of some of our older work and also our latest findings. In the afternoon, we will try to figure out what the evidence means, how this program originated and thrived in Tulsa, what environments have contributed to program success, and what all of this suggests for public policy choices. In short, the morning session will give you a worm's eye view. The afternoon session will give you a bird's eye view. In between, at lunchtime, we're very fortunate that Governor Jared Polis of Colorado has agreed to join us from Denver in a live conversation with E.J. Dion, the Washington Post columnist, and our esteemed colleague at the McCourt School. Colorado recently became probably the eighth state in the nation to adopt universal pre-K. This will give you an opportunity to learn more about Colorado's program, how it originated, how it differs from other universal pre-K programs, and what challenges lie ahead. One of the hallmarks of our longitudinal research project has been its multidisciplinary character. The people who've worked on this project have degrees in many different social science disciplines. At the center of this project has always been a close working relationship between the McCourt School of Public Policy and Georgetown's psychology department and especially Deborah Phillips. Deborah has been a great partner for me over many years and a great asset to Georgetown University in multiple ways. 
She also has a few words to say before our formal program begins at 9 o'clock. Deborah? Good morning, and thank you for being here both in person and virtually. I want to start with an expression of gratitude. First of all, to Bill for uh, greeting me when I arrived at Georgetown in 2000 um, and establishing one of the most remarkable collaborative research partnerships I've ever experienced in my life. And also thank him for really doing 100% of the work, well, maybe 99 <laughs> of the work um, organizing this remarkable day. Um, and it is just a joy to be able to celebrate 20 years of, of working with you, Bill. Our pre-K research in Tulsa began as a partnership with the Tulsa Public School System, as Bill has said, and with CAP Head Start, and sub subsequently with the Oklahoma State Department of Education. And it continues to thrive because of these partnerships. It simply would not have happened without them. David Sawyer, superintendent of the TPS schools in 2001, and Stephen Dow, who's here, CEO of CAP Head Start at the time, each had the courage, and I do mean courage, to let the two of us, unknown researchers from Georgetown University, waltz into their pre-K classrooms and ask if they were producing the benefits that had encouraged the state legislature to fund them. Subsequently, Michael Zuklowski, Keith Ballard, and now Deborah Gist, um, have kept the door open so that we and our teams could continue our research on the developmental impacts of pre-K education. A special thanks is due to Joy Hoffmeister, the state superintendent of public institution, for her ins instruction, sorry, for her steadfast support. I can't say enough about how extraordinary this level of sustained support is, how it shaped the questions we have asked, and how we have been able to share our answers, not only with those in Tulsa and Oklahoma, but across the nation. Thank you all. We have also forged strong research partnerships with the University of Tulsa for the Generation One study, classroom observations, Bill's large team of investigators, and for the Generation Two study with the University of Oklahoma at Tulsa, led by Dr. Diane Horm and Dr. Sherry Castle, who is with us today as well. Um, and I can't say enough about my uh, dear, dear colleague, Anna Johnson, who is doing this Generation 2 study with me. Um, they are all real dream teams that have done all of the heavy lifting, those in Oklahoma in particular, to ensure that this study meets the high research standards that we have set for ourselves. Secondly, a comment about how this 20-year set of pre-K initiatives in Tulsa has developed alongside a remarkable period of policy developments with regard to pre-K education. When we started our research in 2001, 14% of all four-year-olds in the United States were attending state-funded pre-K programs. 20 years later, almost 30% are. In 2001, only two states and a handful of cities, including Washington, D.C., had universal, universal pre-K programs. Today, eight states and a number of big cities have universal pre-K. In short, during the time we've conducted our research, a pre-K revolution has occurred. My final introductory comment is about how our research has also evolved in the context of scientific advancements, has both led and responded to these advancements. You will more, hear more about this during the day as we talk about the Generation 1 and Generation 2 studies. But as one example, the questions being asked of pre-K have shifted from those focused on whether it works to support school readiness, we all know that it does, to whether initial gains are sustained over time, to what accounts for the short-term impacts, and what is it that pre-K sets in motion in children, in their educational experiences, in their circumstances that sustains these impacts. The Generation One and Generation Two studies that you will hear about today reflect this shift 
in the questions that are being asked with pre-K. So with that, let's get on with the show. Thank you. Why are there so many songs about rainbows and what's on the other side? Rainbows are visions, but only illusions, and rainbows have nothing to hide. So we've been told, and some choose to believe it. I know they're on the way and see. Someday we'll find it, the rainbow connection, the lovers, the dreamers, and me. All of us under its spell, we know that it's probably magic. Have you been half asleep? And have you heard voices? I've heard them calling my name. Is this the sweet sound that calls the young sailors? The voice might be one and the same. I've heard it too many times to ignore it. It's something that I'm supposed to be. Someday we'll find it, the rainbow connection, the lovers, the dreamers, and me. I've heard it too many times to ignore it. It's something that I'm supposed to be. Someday we'll find it, the rainbow connection, the lovers, the dreamers, and me. There's growing interest in a number of cities and states to try to fund universal pre-kindergarten programs. Philadelphia is the latest city that wants to create one. Oklahoma has long been home to early childhood education that's widely cited as a model. Special correspondent Cat Wise reports on how a liberal political priority became popular in a conservative state. It's part of our education series on Tuesdays, Making the Grade. A is for apple, ah, ah, apple. In Oklahoma, the ABCs start before kindergarten. D is for dog. Children here begin public education at just four years of age, some as young as three. It's preschool for anyone who wants it, and it costs the state about $7,500 per child per year. I like all those colors you're using. The program is hailed as a national model by the Obama administration and advocates who believe early education creates long-term benefits. What color is that one? White. Very good. Smart cookie. It's a costly government program in one of the reddest of red states, but it appears both Democrats and Republicans believe it's working. It's not every day that a very conservative state like Oklahoma establishes a new social program. It's not every day that a very poor state like Oklahoma establishes a new social program. William Gormley is a professor of public policy at Georgetown University. He's studied Oklahoma's pre-kindergarten program in Tulsa for 15 years. Students are nine months ahead of their peers in their pre-reading skills, seven months ahead of their peers in their pre-writing skills, and five months ahead of their peers in their pre-math skills. Could you help each other if you finish early, please? Those differences were obvious to Lee Elementary School teacher Patty Eaton from the start. Their skill level was uh, quite a bit above the other children that were coming in without the pre-K program. It was pretty incredible to see the difference between the two. Tulsa resident Coral Renteria says her four-year-old daughter Lindsay is thriving. She's only been in pre-K for about two months and she's singing everything, like her ABCs. Okay, what are the songs you sing? A, B, C, D, E, I, Z. At kindergarten entry in Tulsa, the single best predictor of a child's verbal test scores is not race or income, 
whether that child was in pre-K the previous year. Yay, good job. Hi everyone. Welcome to our first panel discussion of the day titled The Short-Term Gains That Set Pre-K Students Apart. My name is Annie Partika and I'm going to be moderating this panel for you all. I'm a PhD candidate in the dual Masters in Public Policy and PhD in Psychology program here at Georgetown. And I've been working as a graduate research fellow on the Tulsa Seed study, the generation two study, for the past four years. So we have four wonderful panelists with us today who will share their expertise on this topic. First, we have Ted Geyer, president of the Niskanen Center, who will present on early studies on the effects of Tulsa pre-K. Next, we have Shirley Adelstein, senior social science research analyst at the Office of Planning, Research, and Evaluation in the US Department of Health and Human Services. And she will be presenting on the social emotional effects of early childhood education in Tulsa. Next, Anna Johnson, Associate Professor of Psychology here at Georgetown, will be presenting on the short-term impacts of the Tulsa Pre-K and Head Start programs using data from the new Generation Two cohort. Finally, Deborah Phillips, who you heard from a bit this morning, is a Professor of Psychology at Georgetown, and she will be presenting a look inside the classroom door in Tulsa across both generations of the Tulsa Pre-K studies. After the presentations, we will have some time for questions from the audience, um, including those of you who are here live and those joining virtually. If you are joining virtually, we encourage you to submit your questions as they arise during the presentations so that we can have some time to get them organized and share them um, with me and the panelists. So now I will welcome Ted to come present. I hope I have the clicker right. Yes, someone will correct me. Good morning, everyone. It's great to see you all today. Uh, this is a, a trip down memory lane for me. It's really nice to see some old friends that I haven't seen in quite a while. Uh, I will be uh, presenting on the early studies of the effects of Tulsa pre-K. There we go. I put an exclamation point. I'm feeling quite sentimental that it's been nearly two decades. I can't believe I've been doing anything for nearly two decades. Uh, these are the original works that we worked on. Just to stick with the theme of sentimentality to get ready for this, because I haven't been working in this literature in a long time, I went and looked through my old files, and I found, for some random reason, my wife's uh, breastfeeding log for our newborn, <laughs> who we just dropped off at college last week. <coughs> so uh, it was, uh, it's been a kind of an emotional time. Anyway, these are the three uh, original studies. Uh, I'll be kind of summarizing the methods that we use for all three and the results for the last one in particular. Uh, <clears throat> the focus of the early research was really a methodological one. I, you know, uh, Bill talked about sort of the different bedfellows that got drawn into this project. I am, I think his phrase was one of the former researchers and I'm an economist. Bill and I were colleagues for many years at Georgetown and I do remember sitting around talking about his new project and uh, being the methodological geek I am, sort of getting into some of the ways he might uh, think about estimating what he was trying to get at. So the early methodological question was, how do you assess the impacts of a voluntary pre-K pre program, voluntary being key there, given the likely selection bias? So if you look at kids who went to a pre-K program and kids who didn't enroll in a pre-K pre program, uh, uh, an analysis or a comparison of the two would be a, a little bit naive because some families chose it and some families didn't choose it and they could differ in so many different ways that can contribute to the outcomes. So that was what we were trying to grasp at and um, here are some of the questions that I think will be uh, touched on throughout the day. Our focus in the early research, <coughs> excuse me, was the first one, uh, does the Tulsa pre-K program enhance school readiness in the, in the in the, uh, uh, and showing up in test scores in particular. If you don't see that effect, it's hard to then get into the later questions. Is it scalable to other environments? Bill talked about the nature and the, uh, of this program, uh, that it's uh, well-qualified teachers and the funding for it is uh, generous. Uh, what would apply? Could you scale that up to other programs nationwide? Uh, do the effects persist? We were looking at short-term effects, later research uh, that you'll be talking about today was looking at long-term. 
Should it be mandatory or voluntary? Should it be universal or means tested? Do you want to target it to those most in need? It's kind of a standard cost benefit. But our focus in the early research was the methodological question, how do you deal with the selection bias, in particular focus on the first question here, does it actually lead to test score gains that suggest school readiness? Okay, as I said, uh, and Bill touched on some of this too, we were looking at a high quality program that uh, Tulsa or Oklahoma had set up and a very diverse uh, student population. The state provides full funding to the public schools with no match required. All teachers uh, have a college degree and a certificate in early childhood education. And I said, you can see the diversity range for the population. I think this was a 2006, if I'm getting it correct. And the way we try to deal with the selection bias is what we uh, call a regression discontinuity research de design. The children uh, qualified to attend the Tulsa pre-K program. They were qualified if and only if they were born uh, before a certain birth date. So if you were day two young, you weren't in. If you were day older, August 31st, you were in. And conveniently for us, from a, from a testing or from a uh, research point of view, they uh, gave the same uh, uh, tests to those who had just finished pre-K and those who were just beginning pre-K. Again, you wouldn't want to take all the kids who had just finished and look at the kids uh, or those starting kindergarten and compare the kids who went to the pre-K versus those who didn't because those could be two very different populations. But what you, we can do instead is compare the test scores of the kids who just missed the cutoff. Those were just uh, too young, but barely too young to make it and therefore were just starting pre-K, and those who just made the cutoff uh, and just finished pre-K. And the assumption here to deal with the selection bias is those two sets of children should be similar. They're only a day apart in age, and otherwise you wouldn't expect any discontinuous uh, differences in their characteristics that could lead to test score differences. This is just a stylized diagram of what we were trying to do. Uh, if you plot age on the x-axis and test score on the y-axis, the left-hand side is the control group. We are uh, hypothesizing here that older kids, by and large, score higher. So both those lines are upward sloping. And again, to the extent that you would see a test score effect, you would see that discontinuous jump in test scores that you could credibly attribute to the program as opposed to other factors. Uh, I'm going to quickly just go through the findings. The findings were very large of test score effects. These are all in months. Uh, test scores of nine months, seven months, and I can't see that. I think it's five months for the three different test scores that we were looking at, which are considerable. The effects were larger for those who qualified for a free lunch, uh, next highest for those who were partial free lunch, and next highest, again, for those who did not have free lunch. Again, positive effects for all of them, and again, really substantial test score effects. And then finally, if you look at the uh, effects by race and ethnicity, very uh, strong effects for uh, Native Americans, and for blacks, a little less so for whites and mixed for Hispanic. I think we had, Bill and Deborah can correct me if I'm wrong, I think we, we found different effects for, for the previous studies differentially as well. So I was told I have five minutes, so I'm gonna conclude with that. Uh, my conclusion is uh, fondly looking back on our original research, I think the regression discontinuity was a nifty design to credibly address the problem of selection bias. And the results that we found really uh, suggest a substantial short-term gains in the three test scores that we analyzed, gains across races and across free lunch status. So I will stop there and turn it back over to the moderator. Oh, who am I turning it to? Shirley, take it away. Okay, good morning, everyone. A little shorter than Ted. Um, I am pleased to be here today to present some of the findings from research on social emotional effects of early childhood education programs in Tulsa. Uh, the findings I'm going to describe were published in a paper in child development in 2011 that uh, I was privileged to co-author with Bill, Deborah, and our collaborators Katie Newmark and Kate Welty. There's also a policy brief on the Crocus website summarizing these findings for those who are interested in learning more than what I can say in five minutes. 
So the motivation for this work was that previous research, including, of course, research in Tulsa, as Ted described, had documented really compelling evidence of cognitive gains from preschool participation. But generally speaking, less was known about social-emotional impacts of early childhood education. And the research that existed showed mixed findings, positive, negative, null. And we knew that this was a very important question because social-emotional development is associated with a, a wide range of outcomes for children. So with that in mind, in the Tulsa context, we examined two questions. First, what are the effects of school-based and Head Start preschool programs on social-emotional behavior at kindergarten entry? And what are the effects in particular for poor children proxied by eligibility for free lunch? So we focused on four-year-olds in the TPS pre-K or CAP Head Start programs in the 2006 to 2007 school year. And to assess social emotional outcomes, we used a couple of different instruments. One was the Adjustment Scales for Preschool Interventions, or ASPE. Uh, this is comprised of 144 yes or no statements. We had kindergarten teachers assess children at kindergarten entry, so they would check yes or no as to whether a child displayed a certain behavior. Mostly negative, some positive. We coded them to move in the same direction. And these statements kind of captured individual behavior and also some classroom context level things, but I won't focus on that today. We supplemented this with a um, attentiveness index, which was the self-regulation subscale from the instrumental competence scale for young children. We analyzed those 144 items from the ASPE using a method called factor analysis, which is basically just a technique for identifying patterns among a large number of items and grouping them into categories. So based on that analysis, we identified five what we called phenotypes. They're listed here on this slide. And we essentially created a score for each child for each phenotype. And we had a pretty high response rate. 77% of kindergarten teachers uh, completed the assessment, or 77% of children were assessed by their uh, teacher. Now, in the social emotional context, we used a different method than what Ted described. Regression discontinuity is a very rigorous method for estimating impacts. But in the social emotional context, we were worried it wouldn't be a good fit. In particular, we were concerned that teachers would apply the same instrument differently depending on whether they were assessing preschool students or kindergarten students. In other words, kindergarten teachers would be more likely to hold students to, say, a higher standard of maturity. And so we kind of have bias coming right out of the gate. Instead, what we used was a method called propensity score matching. The idea here is that we use a range of characteristics, covariates we drew from a parent survey and administrative data, to create a matched comparison group. So kindergarten students compared to kindergarten students, but ensuring that they have very similar observed characteristics, and therefore likely also unobserved characteristics. We matched separately for the CAP Head Start sample and the TPS Pre-K sample, created very similar looking groups, and then analyzed them using regression analysis that controlled for various things as well as the classroom. You can see here that the original sample shrunk down a little bit because of assessment completion rates and also because some children weren't matched. So what did we find? This figure comes from the uh, policy brief that I mentioned. In short, we found some evidence that children who participated in both programs were less timid than comparison group children. This finding was conventionally significant for TPS pre-K, marginally significant for CAP Head Start. When we limited to uh, free lunch eligible children, which isn't shown here, um, the results for TPS pre-K remained marginally significant. And these are modest in terms of the size, but they're consistent with prior literature. And notably, we didn't find any negative effects, which some prior literature had found um, for, for instance, center-based um, early education. This is findings for the attentiveness index. We found that for TPS pre-K, children who participated in the program displayed greater attentiveness than comparison group children who looked very similar. We didn't find a similar effect for CAP Head Start. And when we limited to poor children, the TPS finding remained marginally significant. 
So what do we make of this? Certainly uh, matching requires some assumptions, so we should keep that in mind, and we were relying on teacher ratings exclusively, and in some cases, small samples. Nevertheless, I think this work really gave us a lot to think about. First, it suggested that school-based pre-K doesn't necessarily trade off social-emotional development for academic readiness. And second, I think it provided um, some interesting food for thought regarding the different findings for Head Start and TPS pre-K, a theme that came up in other research that Crocus has produced. There are a number of possible reasons for that, which we could certainly discuss further. Pre-K students had already been in a school setting. Uh, we know that the TPS program produced somewhat larger cognitive gains, so maybe children were more confident, less timid going in. Program characteristics differed. Head Start students were more likely to be in a full day program. And of course, Head Start students are a different population, more disadvantaged, and it can be hard to capture all of that, even with a rigorous matching design. So I'll conclude there, but uh, I think that this work provided some very interesting fodder for future work and conversation, and I look forward to discussing it further. So with that, I think Anna's next. Hi, <clears throat> excuse me, thank you for having me. This is a wonderful opportunity. I'm very excited to talk about uh, the next generation of Tulsa research, um, the Tulsa Seed Study, and I've titled my uh, presentation, Still a Great Beginning, um, Positive Short-Term Impacts of the Same Programs You've Been Hearing About, Tulsa School-Based Pre-K and Head Start. This is work with a ton of collaborators, my graduate student, Annie, Deborah Phillips, Diane Horm, Sherry Castle, of course, um, at ECI, CAP Tulsa, Tulsa Public Schools. Okay. Uh, I'm gonna just talk, um, you'll hear from me again uh, in, in the next panel, so I'm gonna see how much I can get done in reasonably paced speech in five to seven minutes. Um, I wanna really set the stage for what the Tulsa Seed Study is. Um, it's the study of school experiences and early development. Um, we've been following families and children from low-income households in Tulsa since 2016. We started when children were three years old. At the time, they were in CAP um, or EDUCARE programs, and then at age four, into TPS school-based pre-K programs. We've been following them ever since, including during the years when schools were closed in COVID. Um, just now, they've entered fourth grade, and this will be the final year of our longitudinal study. Um, so the presentation I'm going to give right now, it will be very short, um, it focuses only on results from these waves uh, that I've shown you here, these three waves, when children attended either a TPS uh, public school-based pre-K or a CAP Tulsa Head Start in their four-year-old year, year. Um, and we're looking at effects on their kindergarten and first grade outcomes. The key questions are, are they better off, kids who attended pre-K versus those who didn't, and on what outcomes? The research you heard from uh, Ted um, talked about uh, effects on really important test scores, the Woodcock-Johnson letter word ID task, applied problems, and spelling tasks. Um, that, those are outcomes that have been used in a wealth of pre-K studies, and they are indeed important, and they show large positive impacts. They also tend to be the skills that most kids learn in kindergarten, and they thus tend to be the skills where we see a decreased advantage of pre-K participation as kids get older. So one of the goals of the Tulsa Seed Study was to gather a larger set of outcomes so we could ask about persistent effects beyond kindergarten on outcomes that might be more likely to show sustained benefits. So we measured letter word ID and applied problems, that single measure of math um, that earlier studies used, as well as other cognitive skills and a large set of self-regulatory skills. This does not exactly overlap with the social emotional skills Shirley just talked about, but there is some overlap. So self-regulation is attention, it's task persistence, it's impulse control, um, and it's working memory. So we have some measures of those kinds of things and they do intersect a little bit with what Shirley talked about. Um, so our study takes a, a broader perspective, a deeper dive into a wider pool of outcomes. Um, and along with other studies currently collecting data, like the SEED study currently in the field, um, asks about the short and longer term effects of preschool attendance in TPS or CAP on this wider range of outcomes. Our sample is 850 approximately. Um, low income children, I should have said earlier, uh, I think I did say that we're focused on low income households only in the Tulsa Seed Study. That's an important distinction from the earlier work. 
Um, some of that work did select on the free and reduced price lunch subpopulation, but our entire sample is um, families from low income households. About 850 low income children in those three waves that I'm gonna talk to you about through first grade, attending either school-based public pre-K, that includes four affiliated charter schools in Tulsa, or CAP Head Start, and we actually include a handful of Educare uh, attendees who were four years old. Um, Educare serves a very small number of four-year-olds, or at least it did at the time we collected our data, so we've grouped those kids in with Head Start. And we compare them to non-attenders, most of whom stayed home with parents, some of whom with relatives. They attended no center-based preschool. Again, the measure is the same kind of narrower set of outcomes used in most prior studies, plus a broader range, cognitive and self-regulation. Um, and we use matching, and I won't go into it, it's exactly the same uh, method that Shirley used. Um, in our case, an RDD doesn't make sense once you've left the fall of kindergarten because then RDD relies on kids who are about to enter pre-K and kids who have just finished pre-K and eventually they all get pre-K. So if you're looking in the out years, you can't rely on that kind of a strategy, so we rely on matching as well. And here are our results for our English language and literacy outcomes. So a little orange triangle is TPS pre-K and a little blue square is our Head Start attenders. The y-axis is an effect size, so that's a standard deviation unit. And you'll see a horizontal dotted line that is a zero line and estimates that cross the zero line are the ones that are non-significant. So in kindergarten, on this letter word ID task, the same task that the earlier studies, the generation one study focused on, you see that positive impacts in kindergarten, at least for the TPS group, the orange triangle group, those impacts fade by first grade. So both the orange line and the blue line have now crossed that horizontal zero. If you look at other outcomes that we collected that are wider than what most pre-K studies have collected, you see sustained effects through first grade on phonological awareness, which is another dimension of early literacy. Um, expressive vocabulary kind of pops around, but for the TPS kids, it is actually statistically significant at both kindergarten and first grade. So expressive vocabulary is a little bit more of a complex language skill. And then sentence structure, which is something like reading comprehension, is statistically significant at kindergarten and first grade for both groups of pre-K attenders. For math, applied problems, the same math task used in prior studies, significant effects at both time points. Another measure of math called numerical fluency looks like it's increasing as children age. So there's a sustained pre-K effect that seems to actually become statistically significant the farther kids get away from pre-K. This is probably a practice effect. It's a very pure measure of math, so that's a positive effect on math. And finally, conceptual accounting, which is a deeper understanding of the concepts that underlie arithmetic, seems to also be positive and sustained for kids in our sample at both kindergarten and first grade. We were surprised to find no effects on self-regulation that were statistically significant at any time point. Oh, I think I can go back. Sorry, guys, that was fast. Uh, all of those cross that zero line. This is cognitive flexibility, so switching um, tasks, inhibitory control, kind of inhibiting impulses and sustaining um, attention, even if a task is kind of boring, uh, and working memory. So none of those were statistically significant um, at kindergarten or first grade in our study. So the key takeaways, it's still a strong start to early learning in Tulsa. It's great news. Preschool attenders outperformed non-attenders, both those in public school-based pre-K and often those in Head Start, um, often into first grade. Uh, we see those strongest sustained effects on these expanded literacy language and math outcomes, um, but not on self-regulation yet. You'll see me again in... 15 minutes and I'll talk about that. Um, it's really important for future studies um, to keep taking a deeper dive, a broader lens into expanded outcomes so that we are able as a field to harness the full potential of preschool and tell an honest story about what preschool does and doesn't sustain in the later elementary middle school years. Thanks. Those are my collaborators and my funders. Okay, there we go. Uh, good morning again. Um, we get asked a lot, as you can imagine from what you've heard so far, what is the magic sauce that Tulsa has invented that leads to such strong developmental impacts? I'm not gonna give you a recipe 
because we don't really have it yet. We're working on it. Um, nor can we assert causality from any of the results that I'm going to share with you uh, momentarily. But I do want to share with you what we've learned from looking inside the pre-K classroom doors in Tulsa, starting with our two, two spring of 2006 data, our Generation 1 study, and then sharing a glimpse of what we saw 12 years later in the spring of 2018 in our Generation 2 study. In the spring of 2006, a group of education students from the University of Tulsa were trained and certified to observe every single school-based and Head Start four-year-old classroom in Tulsa. I think they may have missed one or two for reasons of illness or whatever. Um, they used the class, uh, which I'm kind of assuming you're familiar with, um, that measures uh, quality of classroom management, emotional support, and instruction. And a second measure developed by Carolee Howes that captures how teachers spend their instructional time with regard to literacy, writing, math, um, science, and social studies and fantasy play. The big takeaway from the class back in 2006 was that the quality of instruction in the Tulsa Public School four-year-old classrooms, these are the school-based classrooms, was significantly higher than the average instructional quality in similar classrooms around the country, all led by these highly qualified teachers with BA degrees and special educa and, um, early education uh, certification. These comparison data came from 11 states that at the time accounted for three quarters of all four-year-olds participating in pre-K programs um, around in those states. So here you can see the blue bars are the Tulsa public school programs and the red bars are the multi-state pre-K classrooms and significant difference after significant difference in terms of specific elements of instructional quality. We also learned that the teachers in Tulsa, compared to these equally well-educated teachers around the country, spent significantly more time on specific instructional activities. And I'm hoping you can read the, the little labels here. Again, significant finding after significant finding in terms of, of uh, important uh, activities that support early learning. So can we assert that the high quality of the TPS four-year-old classrooms accounts for the strong outcomes that you heard about from Shirley? Um, not really, um, but we did get a few associations between these class scores in particular and child outcomes at kindergarten entry. When we looked separately at the school-based and the Head Start uh, classrooms in 2006, we saw that the school-based teachers spent more time on literacy and math instruction, while the Head Start teachers spent more time on fantasy play. And this surely reflects the emphases of the two different programs. One focused very much on the whole child, a lot of emphasis on social emotional development and peer interaction, as well as academic skills, and the school-based programs that were more directly focused on um, cognitive uh, learning. So uh, fast forward 12 years, uh, when the world of pre-K research had grown at least as interested in children's self-regulation capacities, which Anna nicely defined for you, saves me 10 seconds, um, as in cognitive outcomes. Um, it has actually been speculated that these foundational skills that enable children to learn the cognitive academic stuff um, are, as they are hopefully fostered in pre-K, um, may drive lasting impacts that are seen later on as children make their way through elementary school and beyond in both cognitive and social emotional arenas. So with a focus on self-regulation, um, as is the case in our second generation study, what warrants observing in the classroom? What, how might we think about a self-regulation supporting pre-K classroom? Um, and this was sort of the, what we were playing around with, have been playing around with in the second generation study. So this is what we looked at. 
Um, we looked at the teachers' both classroom level and child behavioral um, management strategies. We looked at the emotional climate in the classroom. We looked at the extent to which teachers very explicitly support positive peer interactions. These are all group uh, 30, you know, 20, 20 to 30 child classrooms. Um, and we also looked at teacher well-being. There had been a growing literature looking at the teacher as a person <laughs> um, and her, I'll say, because they mostly are female, um, the supports and stresses she experiences as a pre-K teacher, the benefits and salaries that she receives. We also revisited the class to see what, what had changed over time. Um, so here you see the class scores in 2006 in blue and 2018 in red for the school-based and Head Start classrooms combined. Um, they are small but not significant differences. So the bottom line here is that Tulsa has maintained very high quality pre-K classrooms um, over the 12 years that we, we looked at those specific classrooms. However, we also found, as many others have now found, that the class scores are not very predictive of short-term or long-term uh, child outcomes, thus our interest in some of these other elements of what children experience in the classroom. Um, that of all of our assessments of teacher well-being, and we we put a lot of uh, time and effort into assessing teacher well-being. It was actually salaries that support a living wage that stood out as the only element that really showed um, significant prediction of, and again, just a couple of child outcomes. Um, and finally, that it's very important in the context of teacher-child interactions, which again, to remind you, were very high quality in these Tulsa preschools, both instructionally and with regard to social-emotional development. But there are things that teachers do, um, surely unwittingly, that effectively put these little four-year-olds on high alert. Um, this happens everywhere, I'm sure. Um, and that these behaviors can actually undermine the development of self-regulation. Thus, the words of first do no harm, don't only focus on what teachers need to do, but spend a little bit of time focusing on what they should not be doing. Um, in sum, the Tulsa school system established and has maintained a very high quality pre-K program, truly a model for the nation. Not without variation, not without room for growth, but one which has been documented repeatedly to do a great job of preparing children for school. Yeah, thank you. So now we'll have time for questions. So now we'll take time for questions, and we'll start with a question from the audience um, and kind of bounce between audience and virtual questions. Um, so yeah, I invite you to um, I guess just raise your hand and ask a question and try to speak loud if possible. So, mic's on the way. Okay, mic's on the way. So we'll have a mic that can be uh, brought to you if you have a question. Yeah, over there. What's your theory as to why class doesn't predict outcomes? And do you have any theory as to do you have any wild and crazy ideas about things you could measure in the classroom objectively that would predict outcomes? Uh, I mean, okay, teacher salaries, but uh, other than that. Um, so we do hope to get some movement on some of these specific elements that we're looking at in the Generation 2 study as the children move on into the elementary grades. Um, it's a real conundrum. You know, you probably know if you know the childcare literature that for the last, oh my gosh, dare I say 50 years, we've been trying to understand what constitute quality in an early childhood classroom. We do know that different children in the same classroom ex have different experiences, so there are efforts and we've, we've worked with them to literally look at, kind of go child by child to capture that variation and that carries some promise. Um, but it, it's, an, it's an ongoing dilemma. What, what is it that happened in pre-K 
that truly makes a difference. Do you want to chime in on that, Anna? I mean, I think that, you know, that there are, um, just in the last couple of years, there have been a couple of papers published, none of us to my knowledge are co-authors on them, um, examining the class um, from a kind of psychometric perspective and trying to understand why it's not predictive in, in most other studies. Uh, it's, it's either modestly weakly or not at all associated with child outcomes. Um, and I think uh, the field is struggling with that because it's, there's been a lot of financial and time investment in training people to um, self-assess for programs to use those assessments um, on the assumption that they represent something important for child learning, and perhaps they do, but not in ways that our measures of outcomes are picking up. Um, I think there is a, related to what Deborah said, you know, suspicion that the global nature, uh, that it, that's an all-class assessment, um, obscures individual teacher-child interactions. So one of the tools that we and some of our um, cohort, so there are a handful of other pre-K studies currently in the field um, at the same kind of pace and cadence as the SEED study. Um, and those studies and our, our SEED study are using measures that focus on individual teacher-child interactions um, so that we can say what individual children are experiencing and try to link that to outcomes. Um, so that's a to-be-determined piece of research. I, I don't want to call my colleague Sherry Castle out, but she's the person that I always go to when I'm trying to understand um, why the class does what it does. So if there's time and, and if Sherry's so inclined, she may chime into the conversation as well. Can I just add one quick thing, if, if you want to put your hand up, Sherry? Um, there also have been efforts over the years to look at whether quality has to get to a certain high level before it begins to have positive impacts for little kids, sort of threshold analyses, if you will. And there are um, replicated findings showing that you really have to, so the class has a one to seven scale, seven being high quality, and that you have to really get almost up to a five. <laughs> Um, and it's in that five to seven range that you start seeing positive impacts on the children. So there's that element to this too. Sherry, do you want to chime in? Yeah, I don't want to take too much of the time. Um, so I do think though that there is a technical component to it having to do with this one to seven kind of scale. Um, the reliability process for observers is also 80% accuracy within one. So that's a three point swing on a seven point scale. Um, that really dilutes the precision with which you're measuring the quality of those interactions and you're also kind of squishing um, intensity of the interactions as well as the quantity as well as the number of children who are experiencing it all into one score that is then assigned to all the children in that classroom. Um, so we definitely see a, a wide range of experiences within a given classroom and um, and there are also con conceptual issues um, just about how quality is, it's very hard to disentangle um, discrete behaviors into uh, different kind of concepts and structures. So, but yeah, happy to talk more about it. We spend many hours. You can join us every Tuesday morning for <laughs> such conversations. <laughs> Hello. Um, I was wondering, um, the uh, teacher salary predicts uh, student outcomes quite well, I imagine. So is it more of like a tenure story? So the teachers who um, have higher salaries, do they have higher tenure? Or is it that they're sorting into schools that are higher income and that's why they have higher salaries? Or are these teachers just higher quality, for instance, and, that, and that's driving results? Or I don't know, do you have a sense sure. of what's going on there? Those are really good questions. Um, so uh, I would have to, I, I would want to look back at all of the sensitivity tests that we did in that particular paper to make sure that I'm giving you an accurate answer. Um, and Annie was, I think, a co-author perhaps on one of those papers. So if anything pops to your mind, feel free to jump in. Um, but um, I believe we did control for teacher uh, age and also time. So teacher salary was, was entered in a regression model predicting outcomes in the presence of a bunch of other variables. And it was over and above those other variables that it was predictive. And I believe we controlled for things that would either proxy or directly capture how long the teacher had been a teacher. Um, all of the schools in our sample, which in that year were almost all of 
the schools because I believe there was a pre-K classroom in every elementary school in the year that we collected those data um, are, uh, um, were community eligible for free and reduced price lunch, suggesting that there's not a ton of variation in the student, the income of the student population that attends that school. Of course, there are schools that have um, different resources. Some work that we hope to do in the future involves bringing in publicly available school, um, elementary school level report card data that gives us more detailed funding about um, you know, per student funding and uh, you know, school level data that I think might get at what you're thinking of. And so I think we're also thinking of you know, what, el what else can we do to understand these more nuanced differences between schools that would explain something that we're not seeing. Maybe it's in quality in the classroom. Um, maybe it's behind salaries. We do know that salaries fuel turnover uh, in programs. So there may be something about teachers with the lower salaries kind of having one foot out the door that might affect what they do. We, we don't know. Again, it's a great question and one we're asking ourselves as well. Other questions? I think we're, we don't have any right now yet virtually, so. Feel free to ask another one live. Yeah, Sherry. So I know we talked about this in preparation, and I'm not sure if we got to the bottom of it, but I was interested um, with the first presentation, and you mentioned selection effect into pre-K. And um, I don't know if you all found in your data, or Stephen, I'm guessing you might be one who would know, like what the saturation point of pre-K was in 2006 compared to whenever we were in the field recruiting for the seed study. I mean, we had almost, I mean, basically every child whose family wanted a slot had a slot. Um, and I think that's something that we're working with to try to tease apart findings from the first generation to now. So I don't know if anyone has looked into that or is able to speak to what the saturation was in 2006 versus 2018. Is this a question of if you wanted a spot, you got it? Or Correct. what percentage of people took it? You're, it's the former. Correct. Yeah, I don't remember. I, I don't even know. I don't that. know that number, but yeah. I think the um, percentage of, of four-year-olds was around 60%. That sounds right. Yeah. Bill, is Bill here? Right, but that's <laughs> the know. second statistic. The right? first. So that's, that's the second no, that's, one. Yeah, 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 that's yeah. the second that's one. That's the right. second. Form. And that's 2005 6. But it was available to anybody who wanted. Yeah. They weren't at yeah. capacity in any way. Uh, yeah. there, was no, there was no constraint, I think, Wait at, that right. at least in the early cohorts. Right, yeah. in the early cohorts. That's a great question. Mm -hmm. They couldn't necessarily get into the school they wanted, uh -huh. but they could get into the program they wanted. We did ask for, there was a wait list and we did ask for it. It was long gone by the time we asked for it. Um, but yes, it wasn't not, everyone got a slot if they wanted it, but maybe not at the school they wanted to go to. So the wait list was school-based? Yes, it, and it was totally administered by the school. And it was my impression that it was like a legal pad. So, I mean, <laughs> No, no, not a lottery. No, it was first come, first serve was my, was my impression as well from the conversations we had. Yeah. Yeah, no, it wasn't centrally missed or nothing we could access after the fact. That's what I remember. Yeah, because I know the year we recruited superintendent gifts was like on the news saying, we have slots, please everyone get on the news. Like superintendent guest was on the news saying, everyone, we have slots, please come sign up. And I know Cap Tulsa has always had excess of four-year-olds, you know, for the 10 years that I've been working in partnership with CAP Tulsa. Um, so anyway, that was just something that has come to my mind as we've been sort of revisiting these Gen 1 findings co to compare and contrast with our Gen 2 findings. Has the take-up rate increased then over the 20 years? And additional slots also. Um, you but know, the, the slot number kids yes. take up. Kelly so, Kane, executive yeah. director of Tulsa Public Schools, may have comments. <laughs> 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 we do have knowledge. I can't she has the notepad. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't here back then, so I can't speak to what happened in 2006. But now, and certainly in 2016, um, I think um, 
Anna, you mentioned this, like we do have pre-K in every single school. So there are about 2,200 slots available. Um, uh, 2,400 inclusive of CAP Educare and our other partners. Um, and so there's slots available, but yes, kids don't necessarily get a slot in the school that they want, but they have the opportunity to attend um, in any school. And we have a lot of kids attending now. We have like 67% of our kindergarten cohort has attended pre-K, yeah. the current kindergarten cohort. Yeah, yeah, the penetration rate has increased has significantly um, since yeah. 2006. I don't know Sorry, I, I think it'd be good. We could probably go back and look at the near report cards and see yes. how high. I mean, I think we hit that sort of above 60% level yes. fairly early on. Mm -hmm. And it's been a quagmire for many years to figure out where are those kids that aren't taking advantage of any pre-K. I mean, it's a, huge, it's a huge topic of internal discussion in our seed team, as Sherry said, because our comparison group, because we want to look at these long-term outcomes, we have no choice but to use this matching strategy, which means we're comparing pre-K attenders to an increasingly small group of non-attenders. And the group is small because Hooray, pre-K has expanded and the take-up rate is relatively high. It's If you look at just low-income four-year-olds in Tulsa, and I think someone from Impact Tulsa is here and can probably correct me, um, it's, it's, it's close to 80% if you, if you select just on low-income four-year-olds, if that's your eligibility criteria. It's in the mid-70s. Um, that's really high. DC, it's above 90. So there are places in the country today that far exceed what Deborah was saying, the changed landscape of preschool where, you know, 14% of kids attended in 2006, and now it's something like 30 nationally. Right. Places like Tulsa and in DC, it's even yeah. higher, which means the possible population of kids who don't attend, who you could compare to, and that's assuming you can get them to like sign a consent form and respond to lots of data collection requests over many years, is very, very small. It's challenging. So I just want to make sure, I remember this from the early studies, we didn't know what those kids did do instead of Tulsa pre-K. Is that still the case? You don't we, know if they did another program or if yeah. they were home or whatnot. We have been extremely um, strict in our definition of the comparison group for purposes of you know clean yeah. estimates. Um, and so through survey measures, we've been able to identify at the point of, of um, consent and recruitment, where were you last where were you year? Last year? Yeah. Okay. Well, we had a parent survey for yeah. the, one of the data sources that we relied on pretty heavily for our matching was a parent survey where they reported what children had done, I think the year before and maybe even the year before that. Mm -hmm. But of course the problem is that parent reports of what their children did are notoriously unreliable. Um, so we did the best we could, but without a doubt, a significant portion of the matched comparison group did have some kind of experience the year before that would have been non-parental care. In your day, in the in our yeah. Thanks. Um, <coughs> I'm, oh, sorry. Oh, it's okay. Um, I'm just going to ask a virtual question since we haven't had one of those yet. So this is from Ying Jin, um, and they asked about the effects of these type of early learning experiences and if they extend to children as young as like two or three years old. So if you could speak to anything about. Um, if there's anything on, if these extend to the three-year-old year or even earlier. I would say we don't know. Yeah. <laughs> so much of this work, um, I mean, the field has, has changed dramatically as people like me have been in it for 100 years. <laughs> no. But really, the last 20 years, so much of the focus has been on these state-funded pre-K programs for four-year-olds. So that's where this deeper knowledge of what are the impacts, what accounts for them, has really been developing. There is a large body of research on infant and toddler care, mostly looking at immediate impacts. And quality matters. You know, quality always matters, but what is that active ingredient is the, is the big open question. Yeah. Yeah, from the audience. I would love to hear um, from your perspectives, getting in and seeing all of the effect sizes and for people that are in this early childhood field, it makes so much sense to us. But from, from your vantage point, what does someone who isn't in the weeds with us, like a policymaker or a stakeholder, like what would be that nugget from your work that you would want them to know? 
the nugget. Oh, so <laughs> many nuggets. <laughs> Full of nuggets. Um, oh, man. No, you know, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, even though we haven't been able to identify what is it that, what is that magic sauce? <laughs> What's the recipe? It's very clear that we, you have an incredibly high quality program in Tulsa. So uh, one of my first comments would be, don't take anything away from it, <laughs> you know? Keep your BA level teachers, you know? Keep the, the incredible professional development that you do, you know? So, so, you know, preserve what you have. Don't feel like, oh, we can start chipping away at it now. <laughs> that would be a really bad thing. Um, and I, you know, we may get into this later today too, you know, the big debate about universal versus targeted. I think I can speak for Bill as well, Bill, <laughs> that we've become big fans of universal pre-K again because that's what we're seeing and we're seeing it work. And it probably makes sense, even though the vast majority of kids in the pre-K programs are low income, um, that the fact that they're mixed in with the high income, higher income kids, the fact that it's just sort of the first grade of school, um, you know, it, it's working, you know. No. Other nuggets? I mean, from a methodological perspective, you know, in my current work with the Department of Health and Human Services, we, we do facilitate inquiries to Capitol Hill a lot, for instance. And I think there is a subset of policymakers for whom RCT is the magic word, randomized control trial. So from a methods perspective, I think one lesson from the Tulsa study and also others is that you don't need an RCT to produce very compelling, consistent, rigorous findings. Um, the RDD design, uh, that is such a distinguishing feature of the cognitive impacts that we looked at um, in Ted's presentation is a phenomenal research design. And even though matching, as we've discussed, isn't ideal, you know, you can use it well and produce consistent results. So that would be a methodological nugget for policymakers. Great. Um, so we have just time for one more quick question, if anyone has one. If not, I think Ted had a question. I had a quick question. <laughs> and somebody, and maybe an audience can answer. I'm curious to know what happened to the Tulsa pre-K program during COVID. Uh, that's um, Is that a, a probably a long a answer, but that's Were a great, a great question. Remote? So Were maybe they... like, Anna, you well, can speak this... a little bit to that, and then it can. Uh, somebody from. I mean, I would ask Kelly Kane because <laughs> yeah. our kids were in first grade, and so I know intimately what happened in first, second, and third grade. Um, I know less about that, that year's pre-K students. Yes. So um, for 2020, most of the year our kids were virtual, including our pre-K students. They were virtual. Um, and Karen, I think that was true for Cap as well. And um, so it was interesting having <laughs> virtual pre-K. <laughs> were they provided laptops or they just needed to? Yes, have they were. We had all of our kids had Chromebooks. Um, so we did do daily lessons with our kids, with our teachers. And um, we had, yes, we had lots of take home kits. Daniel's reminding me. I'm like, what happened two years ago? <laughs> um, and because we're ambitious, we actually launched a new curriculum that was a very hands-on curriculum at that time, um, and which was interesting because we launched a Tools of the Mind, which is a play-based curriculum, um, which was really, I think, in a weird way, good for us during the pandemic to have our teachers really focused on how can they engage, engage kids in play-based learning while they were still at home. Um, and then uh, in 2021 is when we came back in person, but it was a little bit back and forth. So it, I think it's gonna be one of those things that's gonna be interesting to see what were the skills that, because that group of kids did have a lot of experience with virtual learning and with computers and things like that, you know, are there skills that they you know, benefited from? Um, I will say, and this is one of the things I'm curious about as you all move forward with studies, is what do we see though has been the impact? Because we have anecdotally certainly seen challenges in terms of things like self-regulation and um, kids being able to be demonstrating some of those other skills that are really important to being in school because, and because they hadn't been socialized, right? So they haven't had a lot of those opportunities. Um, and we saw that play out in the kids, you know, last year and over the past two years. And then certainly we're seeing um, the impacts around foundational skills uh, for not just our kids who were home for pre-K that year, but our kids who were home for 
both kindergarten and first grade as well. We're still um, coping with those impacts. Thank Karen, you. do you want Thank you. At CAP Tulsa, we, 2020 was largely virtual. We did stand up very quickly a virtual curriculum for teachers to use um, our standard curriculum, the uh, teaching strategies creative. And we provided uh, learning kits, learning packs that through a drive-through process at all of the schools that were age appropriate, that had books and creative uh, arts type things and manipulatives that mirrored the curricular activities. And there was a combination of small group, individualized instruction and phone calls um, by the teachers to all the families. We didn't have daily instruction, attendance was measured more loosely, I'll say. It was more based on participation a certain number of times per week. And we focused mightily on social emotional skills. And we have seen in our own data and the data that OU is helping us collect that there has been a positive effect during the pandemic of um, from fall to spring of social emotional learning. Less so for the cognitive skills as we anticipated but we decided just to focus on what, we, what, on what we thought was most essential for, for children and families. This was not individual instruction. This was family engagement. Um, and we did hand out numerous Chromebooks to families. Perfect. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much. Um, and the next panel will be on the longer term benefits of pre-K in Tulsa. Thank you. Thank you.